Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Chris Sullins, CEO of Central Reach, and Clark Lagerman, CEO of Avidon Health. Clark, tell us about your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, I, well, I spent the majority of my professional career working for some of the largest healthcare companies in the world. And to get a behind the scenes look at what was happening, I became frustrated and also compelled to make a difference. So after lamenting on many ideas I had um, over the course of many years, I eventually put my money where, where my mouth was and went out to build my first company. So started it with a, a great idea that lacked some of the product market fit, eventually sold that company and built a new business that I think is really compelling for what the needs are of today, which is the diversity within populations and their need to have access to high quality information that helps good people break bad habits. Great. Thank you very much, Clark. And, and Chris, and that you have a little more experience with a few more companies. So talk to us about your leadership journey. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I had a different path. So I think, you know, I, um, spent a lot of time in larger companies, frankly, in a diversity of like executive roles uh, over my career. Um, and when I started kind of the entrepreneurial side of it, it was really, I was recruited uh, to come into a small um, software as a service company uh, by somebody I worked with, an investor at one of the larger companies that I was at, Service Master. Um, and uh, was recruited to come in to take over from a founder. So as opposed to starting a company and coming up with the idea, I'm the guy typically that comes in after that uh, to figure out how to scale scale it up. Um, and so my first scale up was was Workwave, um, and I was there for almost uh, almost eleven years. Um, and uh, you know we grew that company over ten x in terms of, of ARR growth. Uh, we did it profitably. It was in the field service space. Um, we actually um, sold that company to uh, a larger uh, ERP company called IFS, uh, which is a Swedish-based ERP. Um, and after kind of transitioning that, I was lucky enough to have Insight recruit me to come to Central Reach. Um, and uh, in Central Reach, I basically did the same thing uh, in a different space. Um, and so that's... Uh, that's basically kind of how I, I've gotten here, but it's really focused on how do you take uh, a company that has that product market fit um, and then scale it up uh, to become kind of a larger enterprise uh, business. Great. Well, I look forward to getting into more of those details because it's really fascinating. So Clark, talk to us more about your company. What does it do? Yeah, well, what, who do we talk about and who do we try to address the problem for? And that's people. So think about the diversities that you have in your family life, your professional life. Each of those people have different unique ways to learn. So we've created a content platform that uses cognitive training to get people that are trying to break very difficult habits like smoking, alcohol addiction, maybe they're not sleeping well at home either, and implement strategies to help them do this through digital coaching. So we teach people how to untrain the bad behaviors that they've developed over time and do it through a scalable approach. Great. And you work with hospitals or who are your customers? Yeah, work with all types of organizations that have diverse populations. So everyone from large healthcare systems to payers and even employers that have individuals throughout the country that are looking to do this for themselves. Got it. So it's a platform that all the employees can use to improve their mental well-being, correct? Yeah, it's, it's a digital platform that they can use. It also is a digital platform that can empower clinicians to drive care for their populations as well. So it's two-sided. Got it. And um, did you say you're using AI or, or is that coming into the fold at all or is it just human to human? The, there is an element of AI where we look at the Jim Baroods of the world and we see how he consumes content. And when we see another Jim, but Jim is one of one, so it probably doesn't happen too often. When we see other Jim Baroods, we use that same type of um, methodology and approach with AI to start serving up content relevant to him to make sure he consumes that. But healthcare, and Chris, you would attest this, 
Healthcare is personal, it's human. Mm -hmm. It's driven by interactions like this. So relying strictly on AI doesn't quite do the approach that we think is necessary to get people to change behaviors and to ultimately seek out healthier habits. Got it. And give us one, I thought I saw some statistics um, that you guys highlight as far as compliance or improvements in health. Give us sort of a, a, some data point. Yeah, I mean, some of the most difficult to break habits we can reverse and change. So people that have been smokers for years or have alcohol addiction problems, we can reduce that by over 50 percent. Wow, that's incredible. That's that's really good. Good to, good to hear. All right, Chris, tell us more about your company. Yeah, so Central Reach. Um, so we're the leading electronic medical records, EMR um, player in uh, in the ABA, uh, so applied behavior analysis, uh, which are behavior analysts who work with uh, children uh, and individuals who have autism. Um, and so we provide a software and service platform. Um, so it's not just SaaS. Uh, we have services that we wrap around the software that enable these behavior analysts, special ed teachers, job coaches, others to unlock the potential um, and produce what we call superior outcomes um, for those that they're help, helping. Um, and so predominantly that's folks that are on the spectrum, uh, but it also expands, especially in the uh, older individuals and in a school setting uh, to broader individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, IDD. And so Chris as well, give us one data point as far as the impact your company is making. Yeah. So, um, you know, since we provide software to the behavior analysts who are who are working with those on, on the spectrum, I guess the one one metric is just the predominance of, of ASD and how that's growing. Um, so one in 44 individuals today um, are diagnosed to be on the spectrum. And so um, and there's really a dearth of um, kind of behavior analysts to be able to work with us. And so, so things like technology really allow them to scale and to serve more of those individuals um, through technology and kind of create more capacity, which is, which is mission critical kind of uh, for the families that, that are looking for help and the individuals that need it. Got it. Well, speaking of scale, you guys have done really well during this horrific pandemic uh, and, and the companies have both grown. So Clark, tell us how your company has, has grown during these past two plus years now. Yeah, I think of, I look at trends. So the trends of people before COVID and we'll, we'll talk about something I think is probably near to a lot of us, it's stress, mental anxiety, depression. So one in 10 people suffered before COVID with this um, condition or you know issue. Um, through COVID, it went up to four in 10. So it was a four X impact that this has. And so you think about these people going to work every day, the reduction of productivity, the absenteeism issues. So there was just this enormous swell of a need to have action and information that helps people in situations just like that, but doing it in a way that is digital because you're not, you weren't working with people. So we had a content suite that was quickly pivoted into offering services completely digitally for our providers but also for our coaches to bring education into people's homes, but in, in education that also has a big impact that lets people get these healthy habits back restored. So we've been doing that through COVID. And because of that, um, we've kind of seen a, a big growth in our team and also a big impact for a lot of people that desperately need the help. Great. Thanks, Clark. Chris? Yeah, I think, um, so I'll, I'll take it into um, kind of vein. So, um, from a from an industry and a market standpoint, um, you know the services that are provided, especially by um, by the therapists um, who are working with with the uh, with the individuals. Um, you know, it's there's typically a physical component to it. So um, so it's not a service that can a hundred percent pivot to telehealth or or digital services because some of the behaviors that you're working on are physically oriented. Somebody runs away when they're trying, you're trying to teach them, they might hit, they might kick, they might, you know, and so, so there was, when the pandemic hit and, and things shut down, there was really a, a pretty big drop, a 50% drop in the number of billable services that were being provided 
um, literally from like mid-March through April. It just fell, fell off a cliff. Um, but I think what we saw, um, and it wasn't kind of considered, um, you know, an essential service necessarily, but what you saw with the parents and the therapists is that they treated it that way. Um, so they found a way to navigate through the pandemic to provide those services, both because our providers are very passionate about making sure that they're providing help um, and the families really need the assistance, especially uh, because a lot of individuals who are on the spectrum, uh, routine is extremely important. And so losing touch with that therapist as you go through those this time um, it was really impactful. It's not a linear impact. It, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a deep drop off that takes a long time to kind of build back. Um, so from our business, uh, because we're providing software to them, we certainly didn't see as much of a downdraft necessarily in terms of the impact to us, um, but we needed to help our customers kind of get through to the other side. So you know, as we kind of looked at it, that was first and foremost, so similar to Clark, um, you know, we pivoted in, in some ways to really think about how do we help our clients get to the other side. So one of the things we did was we offered up our continuing education credits, uh, our content that we use for staff development for free to the entire industry, not just to our clients. Um, and so when you think about therapists who are at home and can't provide services, um, they can't go to in-person events, which is where they got most of their continuing education credits, it gave them an opportunity to be able to continue to develop themselves um, in a way that um, really wasn't uh, kind of something that they historically had done. And, and I think there was a lot of appreciation uh, for that. Um, the second was financially, you know, we tried to work with clients to help them kind of manage, manage through this. Um, and then from a, an individual company standpoint, we really kind of focused on, you know, trying to compress kind of expenses, um, but to do so in a way that protected our product development and protected our, our customer service and our customer success. So the two engines of what's going to provide benefit to us. Uh, once we did get through to the other side, but, you know, didn't actually know when that was going to be and whether we would do that. Um, the other thing, two things we did, we did a number of scenario analysis. So we did kind of a worst case scenario as opposed to change our budget, right? So it's like, hey, what would be our death of our company? <laughs> and what does that look like? Um, and then where are the different, you know, potential upsides from there? Um, and that allowed us to, as a board and as a company, to kind of see where we are on that journey uh, and be able to kind of um, react appropriately as we saw kind of which, which scenario path we were on. Uh, and then finally, internally, you know, with employees, we really uh, went to weekly all hands meetings. Um, you know, we did a lot to just try to be as flexible as possible to allow them to manage all the complexities they had, especially parents who had kids and, you know, didn't know uh, kind of when they were going to have childcare, when they were going to be back in school and those kind of things. Yeah, no, and we're going to circle back uh, and, and, and get your insights on that part. But before we do, let's talk about how each of your companies are funded, right? You, we're sort of polar uh, maybe not opposites, but one very, one very small, one very big. And I don't know if people realize, Chris, how big you guys are now. I certainly didn't. And Clark, they don't realize how big you are either. So if you can just give some parameters, sort of whatever you feel comfortable. Many people know me from the, the local ecosystem of entrepreneurship, and they've seen me out at meetups, uh, running events and being a, in the startup game for quite some time. And we all know there's no overnight successes here. So I've been on a long journey, um, nearly nine years now with this company uh, that has been self-funded. So we've seen this growth all through just our own hard work, um, not having any capital infusion. And now we've grown into about 60 employees covering 4 million people throughout um, this country and uh, a few other countries as well. We're in 11 different states with our team. So we've really gone from this idea that was conceptualized at a restaurant in Montclair all the way through into we're making a huge difference in the lives of so many people that need it. 
and we've been growing year over year, um, have won a few awards, kind of highlighting the, the trajectory that we're on. And I think it's been fun to see even the inbound interest um, for us as being a potential target for a lot of opportunities has been fun to see as well. So now we're being suited um, and, and being approached a lot more than we have in the past where normal entrepreneurship and normal startups are seeking out investors and seeking out opportunities. Now, once we've hit the scale that we've seen already, we're getting a lot more of that coming into us on an ongoing basis, phone calls, emails, and asking us what do we want to do, which is, which is a lot of fun to have some options on the table. That's great. Thanks, Clark. Chris? Yeah. Um, so we, um, yeah, a little bit different. So we're backed by Insight Partners um, and uh, Insight um, essentially bought majority control from the founders uh, in 2018, which was, was when I, I joined the middle of 2018. Um, now the difference um, in our business is we um, were very capital efficient. So we've been profitable. So in a lot of ways, we're not raising multiple rounds, uh, similar to kind of how we grew uh, WorkWave as well, um, kind of insight, put their money in, and then we funded it off the balance sheet, essentially, um, you know, from that point forward. So, um, so again, you know, it's insight is kind of uh, the, the one partner that we have and uh, provides a lot of value, but we don't need a lot of capital uh, from them uh, after the fact. So, um, and between, you know, middle of 2018 and today, uh, we've grown the business about seven, uh, seven to eight X, um, which is pretty significant, especially given the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll end this year around 500 employees. So today we're, uh, we're right between 350 and 400 employees. Uh, and we probably have about a hundred job openings left, uh, to fill. Um, and for contacts, when I joined, uh, we were right around 80, uh, employees, um, and we've got a, a good chunk of those, half of them probably are, are remote. Um, we've got almost 90 employees here in New Jersey. We've got um, 120 employees in Florida. Uh, we have an office in, in, uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, and we've got an office in Verona, Italy uh, as well, in addition to kind of uh, the team that we have here in the US. Well, thanks for that. Now, just to clarify, Insight Partners is a PE firm, uh, is that correct? Yeah, so they're, um, yeah, private, they're growth equity for sure. Um, I think they uh, they historically have been venture capital. They do a lot of smaller kind of deals, um, but they just raised a $20 billion fund so they can write big checks for, for scale ups as well. Um, so they kind of sit in between, I think, really the kind of venture capital growth equity. They can go larger for scale ups and make, they're really aggressive at the, at the lower end to find, you know, good businesses that are um, kind of, they're the initial or one of the early funders. In. Right, and, and so your growth has been extraordinary, Chris. Tell us the, some of it's been organic, but you've done some acquisitions too, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've done uh, nine acquisitions and one strategic investment. Um, and, uh, you know, those acquisitions, so when we talk about growth, you know, call it 95% of that growth is organic. Um, so the acquisitions that we've done are not uh, industry consolidation or big transformative type acquisitions. Uh, I tend to focus on smaller startup businesses that have really good product market fit, um, a really smart team, um, and fits kind of the product fits into the longer term kind of platform roadmap I have for central reach. And so what it does is it allows us to bring in talent um, and bring in a product and have that go to market um, kind of motion much faster than it would be if we developed it all ourselves or, or developed it organically. And so, so I would say uh, probably half of those, maybe a little less, um, didn't actually have any revenue. So it was it was an entrepreneur and a product um, that was kind of figuring out how to go to market. And we were able to kind of um, partner up with them, bring them on board uh, kind of before they had that scale. And then that makes it a little bit easier from an integration standpoint to plug in and uh, and, and frankly, a little less risky. Uh, but uh, M&A is never easy. So. 
That's really fascinating, uh, Chris. You know, when you think of nine acquisitions, you think that would have taken a larger chunk of organ- of the growth. But you're saying that it was sort of complementary and, and that the organic growth was the primary driver, which is really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, again, I think there's different ways. We have competitors that have gone out and bought multiple different platforms and, you know, kind of group them together into uh, kind of a larger platform in the space. Um, but from our perspective, it really is much more product oriented. And how do we um, kind of zero in on what our clients need? What are the gaps in the product? And, and what's the fastest path, the best path, frankly, uh, to try to try to get there? Um, and m a for us has been, um, just like it was in WorkWave, uh, a pretty efficient way to do that if you, you know, if you can kind of do it right. Right. And doing it right is not always easy, as we will we'll discuss. But let's talk about first the industry trends. Chris, are you saying that, you know, talk to us about your industry is uh, what mm-hmm. are you seeing in your industry? And I think you're both in similar industries, so maybe there's some overlap. But Chris, tell us about what's going on. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of trends that are going on. Some of them you see um, in broader healthcare and just broader kind of markets in general. Um, you know, one of the ones that's, that's pretty unique um, to autism and, and behavior ABA is really the capacity constraint. When you look at it across each of the different settings, so providers who are providing kind of private pay uh, services uh, to families, um, there's probably half of the therapists in the market um, that are needed to serve all the individuals who, who are on the spectrum. And because of the increasing, increasing prevalence, um, the number of individuals on the spectrum is growing at the low double digits today. So, so it's not a problem where it's like, you know, this is a flat market and we're just going to catch up. It's uh, the market's growing and, and the uh, behavior analysts need to grow more more quickly to try to catch up. Um, so that's one big dynamic, which certainly um, uh, supports the need for technology to try to try to minimize, uh, you know, the capacity constraint there. Um, I think the second is really um, as the the industry has matured, uh, I'll say uh, the market's matured, you're seeing an increase in compliance and regulatory requirements by both payers and states. Uh, which makes it more complex for these small businesses and, and even the larger ones to grow. Um, it's all things that other medical markets have seen, um, but is now kind of coming coming to bear. Um, and, and what that does is it exacerbates the capacity constraint. Now you're spending time doing audits, you know, electronic visit verification, all these kind of things that are being uh, put upon you, which are all good things for the industry overall, generally. Um, but, you know, make it a challenge from a resource perspective. And then the third, and this is one that we saw more broadly and Clark touched on this earlier, is just digitization of, of content um, and, and the pivot. So while I said earlier on, telehealth is, has become a part of the services, direct services typically um, can't be done very effectively through telehealth, but digitizing curriculum using mobile apps to collect more data and be able to analyze the data, a richer data set um, to make better decisions for each of the individuals that they work with. All of those kind of things, um, we see an increase in um, pretty dramatically. And so that's, that's an area that we've made a lot of investment. In. Got it. Thanks. Clark, how about you? You're in your specific. Yeah. So two, two big things I see that, uh, allows for massive disruption in a market, which is exciting because they're both markets that I play within. Um, one, remote work is here to stay. So people are expecting to work at their homes. So there is a lack of an ability for most traditional corporate wellness offerings or healthcare in an employer's setting to reach and engage people at a traditional setting, which would be, I come to someone's office, I engage them with onsite fitness classes or something of that nature. But the whole paradigm has shifted. People don't want to drive into the office. So there is now an expectation to differentiate corporate wellness benefits into a way that's very compelling for people's living today. So the great resignation, we hear this, people are selecting their employer for a variety of reasons, certainly compensation being one, but the type of fringe benefits associated with an employer are incredibly important. So there is a huge appetite for bringing digital services into people's homes that are very compelling and timely. 
That's one. The second thing I think it's really incredible is the biggest leaders arguably in the technology space are physicians and the medical community, typically speaking. Sorry, doctors out there, but this is what we've seen. And Hims pushed uh, a report recently that said 80% of healthcare providers over the next five years are investing heavily in digital technologies, which is incredible to hear because the sort of advent of EMRs and the integration of that has been fought so hard with so much funding going into it. It's incredible to see people are opting in for things like this now because they're all recognizing this big change. So those two levers happening are causing something else to happen, which is incredible, incredible for people in the digital space, digital health space. Money is flooding in here um, at incredible velocity. You have major acquisitions happening from Livongo and Teladoc forming a $37 billion company to regional players that are coming together to just be relevant over the next five years. There's no shortage of investors looking to make oversized returns by coming into this space. So for motivated entrepreneurs, I think there's just such tremendous upside right now. That's great to hear. Uh, and it's great to hear. Hopefully, the end result will be better health care for everyone, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's, let's circle back to sort of lessons learned, right? You had, both have different journeys, similar spaces. Um, let's go back to you, Chris, about the M&A, you know, buying companies, right? And uh, sort of integration and you know, culture. Talk about some things that you've learned over the years that have served you well. Yeah. Um, well, one, like I said before, it's n never easy. Uh, even if it's a small, small deal, um, they, they take sometimes as long, uh, sometimes longer uh, than a larger deal, just because of the um, level of sophistication on the other side, the amount of data and just kind of the, the challenge of kind of, uh, you know, it's a big decision for any entrepreneur to sell your business, right? So, so a lot of success in it in M&A, when you're buying, you know, I'll focus on kind of the smaller businesses, uh, more entrepreneurial businesses is really a trust factor, right? It's like, I'm, this is my baby. <laughs> and I am thinking about entrusting my baby to you. <laughs> um, and I want to see it grow and flourish because that was my vision. And, and really they need to see the path and there needs to be alignment um, going in that allows them to kind of feel like that's the, the vision that, you know, you, you're bringing to bear. There's other M&A that, you know, you do it for cost reductions and these kind of things. That's not the kind of stuff that, that we've done. Um, and so I think there's a lot of what, what I've learned is upfront, um, having the hard conversations early, um, is very important. So you don't wait until you have a contract, you know, purchase agreement in front of somebody to start saying, well, this is what your role is going to be. Here's what our strategy is going to be for your product. Here's how, you know, all those things need to be upfront because nobody wants to, I don't want to waste their time and, and they shouldn't um, want to waste mine if we don't have alignment. So I'd rather learn that early. And that's hard to do, right? Because at the beginning you're like, Hey, I love your company. I love you. I, <laughs> They, you know, everybody's got the happy talk or whatever, but at some point you got to say, well, this is what we need and want to do for this to be successful for us. And sometimes that's not aligned with the entrepreneur. And so, uh, again, it's better for both parties if you kind of, you know, figure that out early. Um, I think the other, from a strategic standpoint, you know, I talked about the product I'll call it product roadmap. It's almost like the business roadmap of, you know, what are all the problems? Like when we think about m and I think about it in context of what are the problems that our customers need to solve? And what is our platform doing to help them solve those problems? Um, what do we do today? And what are things that I'll, I'll say are placeholders where we're either going to develop something, we're going to partner, um, or we're going to buy. Um, and I think if you lay that out early and then you 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 know luckily for us we have a partner in in someone like insight where i can say you know scour the market <laughs> and tell me who are the players that are kind of provide some of these services um and uh and again in a lot of cases you might want to do a deal now because it's good for you but an entrepreneur is not ready to sell now 
So you need to kind of balance between the proactive, like I want to be out there looking for a deal and the reactive of, hey, somebody, an entrepreneur just said, I'm ready to kind of partner up. This is harder than I thought, whatever it may be, more costly. Um, and so to be able to um, react to that quickly, having that kind of roadmap, if you will, for your business allows you to say, oh, this does check the box. Now let me make sure that the product, the entrepreneur, um, you know, if you don't have experience with them, uh, kind of checks the boxes that will be beneficial kind of in, in that market. Um, and then the third going back to the integration, um, you know, I view it like hiring an employee uh, in terms of the fit with the entrepreneur. So um, I'm lucky in that, and this was the case with WorkWave and, and here that vast majority of the entrepreneurs still work with us, um, which is beneficial for a company of our size to have people who are out because they just think differently, right? <laughs> and they help us kind of grow and take advantage of things um, that, you know, typically, you know, the team in a bigger company, you just start to lose some of that entrepreneurial kind of vigor um, and, and focus. Um, but as a result, you know, we need, there needs to be a fit between the way that the entrepreneur looks at the world, the way we look at the world and how we can kind of um, marry those two things together. So it's not always one-to-one, -one, um, but, you know, it's very difficult, for example, to do nine acquisitions and have every single entrepreneur do things their own way, or this is the way I like to hire. Or, this is what it, like, there has to be some alignment. So it's not, it's not like a one size fits all. Um, but it, it has to be kind of consistent with the culture. And we've walked away from deals of very good products that had a lot of momentum where we just felt like the team would be very difficult to kind of work with because they they wanted to do things their own way, which is fine. It just doesn't work in our context. Right. Well, you mentioned culture. Obviously, you must have a strong culture. So within the company itself, during this dramatic growth to not only integrate new companies, but just keep going on the uh, trajectory so yeah. is there you know one or two tips that you know are important in building culture that you found over the years yeah um yeah i mean i've been uh lucky to be surrounded i mean it's all about having good people so <laughs> that's you know that starts it i think from my standpoint um with respect to culture one i don't um culture is like a living breathing thing for me so every new employee that comes in uh affects your culture, right? Every employee that exited exits um, also affects your culture. So, um, so for me, I've always focused on uh, the hiring and the onboarding process to try to make sure we identify the right, the right folks. So, um, so I interview today, almost everybody, historically, everybody that comes into the company has to interview with me, not because I'm like the arbiter of culture, um, but it is a good check and balance. And it also reinforces for our team, the execs and everybody else, like hiring is important. If I'm going to spend most of my time doing it, everyone else should do that. And that is really where you build the culture. If you hire in people who are really great practitioners, but all view the world differently, it's very hard to get them to align after the fact by putting things on a wall. Um, you really need to look for those kind of right DNA to start out with. And if you do that, then they kind of kind of carry the culture forward. Um, finding leaders that see the world the same way that I do and, um, and the rest of the company does is important too. So there's really good executives that I wouldn't work with um, because they see the world differently and they can be very successful. Um, and so that's, that's a key piece uh, as well is that it can't just be, it has to start at the top, but it can't only be at the at the top. It's, it's all the little interactions, the one-on-ones, the kinds of feedback that they get from their manager. Those are the things that become a death for a culture. If the CEO says one thing and everybody else behaves differently down the line with respect to the employees. So, um, so I think that's kind of first and foremost is really trying to set that up front, make sure we get the right leaders and focus on that onboarding and the hiring process. Um, and then the second piece of it is, you know, what you tolerate and what you don't tolerate, right? So nobody likes to talk about like exiting employees from a business, but the vast majority of employees that, 
you know, exit from both Workwave and here um, are, are more from a cultural fit. It's not because they didn't show up to work on time or, you know, um, you know sometimes it's they're not able to kind of scale to where we need to. Um, but for the most part, it's because um, it's inconsistent with the culture and, and letting those kind of things faster really, um, you know, is very dangerous to a, to a company. So, and then the last thing I say is we're not perfect. We don't have the perfect culture and we got a lot of things we can do better. So, um, but I think making it a, um, a first class consideration is important. Well, that, that was really instructive. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. And Clark, how, how about on your side? Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Chris, on being careful of who you let into your family. And for us, I mean, we're a much smaller team, but we do consider ourselves a family. And one of the things I look for when I'm interviewing, which I pretty much interview most of the people that have come into this company for the same reasons you do, is that I, I want to make sure that they fit our culture. I want to make sure they see the world the same way we do. And one of the questions I always ask myself during the interview process is, it's Sunday night, my family's having dinner. Do I see this person at my table having fun? maybe taking care of the kids, washing dishes with us. If the answer is yes, they're the right people to be here and we can train up on the skills. It's, it's the people is, are what matters in, in our view. And we've gone through a journey of being a really cool startup that had the ping pong table and the fun environment to completely virtual. So the idea of creating an, an, an embodiment of our culture in people that never see us anymore or may never meet us outside through a screen has been a challenge for us. So about a year ago, I was on my own personal journey of how do I impact culture in a positive way and how do I maintain the trajectory of our business? And I kind of came across something that I think is really helpful and inspiring for me, which was the work that John Doerr has been doing around OKRs and the idea of creating this abundance of transparency. So individual employees know what I'm working on any day. They know what's important to our business. We share very directly and very transparently, transparently within the company. And we've had some incredible feedback from the team of how positive they view that because they can't just walk by my door anymore. They can't just see me at five o'clock and, and grab a cocktail and have a conversation about what's happening, but they could go onto this now platform and view everything I'm working on on a weekly basis. So it's really helped to align all of us to pull the same way and help everyone feel part of the experience because people have selected us for the place they're gonna spend a large amount of their time every day with. I wanna make sure they're here for the right reasons and they feel connected to the mission that we're on. I mean, our mission is to change lives. It sounds great, but what does that really mean? There's a lot of things that are everything from scrubbing the toilets to having the fun steak dinners. It's everywhere in between that. And I wanna make sure the team feels as connected to this as possible. And speak to that a little bit, Clark. It's really uh, interesting, you know, the OKRs, right? But also how do you build culture in a remote, you know, environment now. I mean, that's a challenge yeah. that's going to be with us now forever. So are there certain tips or tricks that you are, that have worked? Yeah. So, so one being on, on goal setting um, in many, many times people think it's this private experience and what I do, people shouldn't know what I'm working on and reading the OKR um, measure what matters by John Doerr and, and seeing the success of companies like Google, Spotify, Twitter, the darlings in Silicon Valley that people aspire to be, and then companies that you would not expect, like the DNBs of the world, the Targets, and others, more of the brick and mortar, more mainstream companies have all implemented this structure to create this transparency around goal setting. So for us, if the team understands what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, the why behind it has been really helpful for, under, for people to really recognize that we're on a mission of reaching a certain goal that all of us care about. And my small part may be helping them get to their goal a lot easier than without having that. So we do that as one because that's the place that all of us come together to see the activity and the work that we're doing. We also have a lot of kind of fun led through our community of people. So our team comes up with great ideas and we do virtual events. We have things that we try to keep it fun and exciting. And also we do things that we invest in people's communities. So we let the team pick out different charities that matter to them. And we do donations to those charities that are local. It may not be a national organization, but really trying to make a difference where people live, work, and breathe, and making sure they feel as connected to the brand as possible. Great. Anything to add, Chris? Um, no, I mean, I think it's a challenge. Um, so we're um, what we call remote first hybrid, or will be when we kind of officially open the office next month. Um, 
And so we've been remote for two years. Um, and, you know, historically, have, we've managed, uh, obviously, with everyone in the office, same kind of thing. You know, we had the ping pong table and everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it is, I think the goal setting, um, the touch points, you know, again, I think one-on-ones and it, as much as videos, like, not the same as being in person for sure. Um, but being able to kind of at least um, have those kind of one-on-ones that cascade throughout the, the organization um, in essentially mandating that those kind of things happen allows employees to feel like they have a voice. Cause I think it's real easy uh, to get lost, right? If you're not having those connection points, you're in your office, you're doing your work, writing your code, whatever it is. And, you know, after a while, you're like, does anybody even care what I'm doing or <laughs> know what I'm doing? Um, and so I think those finding, you know, ways to do fun stuff, but also just the practical, like, you know, simple one-on-ones, like, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? You know, where are the roadblocks? Um, and then being very um, proactive around trying to, you um, knock down silos. I think it's easier to get siloed in a remote environment. Everybody kind of meets with their team and then they meet with my team um, and not having kind of um, that interaction that you normally have in an office of running into, you know, somebody in finance or whatever, um, you know, becomes kind of uh, very insular. Um, And so you got to be kind of diligent as leaders about looking at that, trying to, um, kind of root it out where, where you can. And it's not, not easy no matter what, but that's, I guess what I would add. Well, I think we can all agree that, you know, remote is here to stay, but let's just look into sort of the future here. One year from now, what do you think the mix of people in the office will be as opposed to remote? Uh, You have, you know, obviously two different businesses, but Chris, how do you see it? Uh, And then Clark, how do you see it? Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. So we actually, um, you know, uh, I like to be counterintuitive. So we uh, are building out a new space in uh, in, in Bell Works right now. <laughs> um, that's bigger than the space that we have in New Jersey. And, and we did build a new space in Florida. So uh, I don't expect it to be 100%. Um, I think that, um, you know, a year from now, um, I don't know what percent of people will be in. Um, I I kind of think of, I guess, the way I think about the office and uh, as part of kind of the context is is almost if you go back to when you're uh, in college, um, uh, ironically, I guess. Um, so, you know, as a college student, you kind of did your work where it made sense, right? You didn't you, didn't, you weren't forced to go to a classroom to do your work whenever you wanted to do it. You could do it in your dorm room. You could go out on the lawn and like collaborate with people or you go to the library when you need to go to the library. You didn't go, you know, or you went to the lab. Um, and so I guess I kind of think of it as not so much of how many people are going to be in, but making the office, you know, be very purposeful around collaboration um, in a place that people can go to do that work when they need to do it. So I don't anticipate like 70% of people or 100% come in five days a week. I think if you make the office kind of purposeful from that perspective, I think you'll have a relatively high number of people that want to go in to participate when they need to in that scenario. Um, but the vast majority of the time they'll do things in their house. Like there's no reason to go to the office to zoom into a meeting. Like, it's like, why (laughs) waste the time doing that? Um, So, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's my hypothesis. It's the way that we're kind of thinking about it. Um, But it just feels like that's, that's a bit of how it's going to evolve is you got to make it a place, a destination where people are like, I get to go to the office. I get to see my colleagues. I'm looking forward to that as opposed to, oh, I got to get in the car, 8 a.m., 7.30, whatever, to get into the office uh, and grind it out for, you know, whatever, nine hours before, 10 hours before I go home. Got it. Clark? 
Yeah. I mean, the word you said to me that you just said, Chris, destination has been a word that's been on my tongue as well as trying to create purposeful environments in which people desire to come back to. I mean, our business, we've, you know, since going completely virtual, closing an office in New Jersey and closing an office in San Diego, we've significantly increased our reach of talent to anywhere anyone Mm -hmm. has an internet connection, which has been unbelievable. And the sort of insertion of culture and talent into the business that we were never able to appeal to when we just were in New Jersey and just were in Southern California has opened our eyes to there's so much more we could be doing to reach the right people all throughout the country. So I will, I think in a year from now, we're not going to change the approach, but we are looking at destinations in which they're close to a major airport where people could come in for purpose exchanges, primarily around a 48 or 72 hours worth of work in environments in which they want to feel excited by coming back to it. But there's tremendous convenience associated with doing your laundry at you know three o'clock on a Thursday. I love that. And I hope my team loves that as well because I want them to have that perfect work-life balance. But also there's a tremendous amount of fatigue when we go back to the earlier mm-hmm. parts of this conversation. The four in 10 of people are suffering from stress and mental anxiety due to COVID social isolation. So we want to make sure that they have connection with people they feel good about, but not strong and armed to come back into the office by any means. Yeah, that's 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 really um, interesting. Those those forecasts seem right spot on, and but we'll see how things play out. So this has been a great conversation. Before we close this out, I want to make sure I ask you know to share just one thing entrepreneurs should know and, and leaders should know when they're considering M and A. Let's start with you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, when it comes to M and A, be a leader and not a follower. So I, I mentioned it earlier, but be thoughtful about kind of the opportunities for M&A in your business so that you can be opportunistic, uh, but don't pursue M&A because a competitor or somebody else bought something. It should fit with what your customers need and solve a real problem in your business. Got it. Clark? Signing the paperwork is just the beginning of the journey. Um, That is the easy part, arguably getting two cultures to come together, two technology stacks, two operational practices is a gigantic body of work, even with the most talented people in the room. So be patient with the process. And if you do the homework ahead of time, you're more than likely to have a successful acquisition merger or you know interdependency within those companies coming together afterwards. Great, thanks. All right, so now we'd like to end our conversation, which has been really great, with a poem or a quote or a saying. So uh, let's go with Chris. Go ahead. Sure. So, uh, so my quote is from uh, Dr. Seuss. I've got uh, two uh, two young ones under the age of uh, of three, so I spend a lot of time with Dr. Seuss. So, it's if you never did, you should. These things are fun, and fun is good. <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks, Chris Clark. I flash back to one of my first jobs out of Rutgers University, sitting in front of a computer screen with the yellow pages and making cold calls to mechanics, to restaurants, to doctor's offices, selling payroll on my desk. And I brought it through to every place I've been and had a big poster of this as well um, in my old office. It says, it's hard to beat a person that never gives up. It's attributed to Babe Ruth. And it's really about the tenacity that you take anything with. And I want myself to remind myself that if you just work hard, you're going to get to the goals you have. It's a great way to think about things. Great. Those are both excellent. Thanks, guys. This has been a really great conversation. I really appreciate having you both on and uh, much success going forward. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.